Okay, uh, welcome back. So in the last session, we were talking about probability distributions and Bayes theorem. And really what we want to do is to be able to compute a posterior distribution of some parameters given some set of CMD observations. That's what, that, that's what the goal is. Uh, what we'll be talking about in this session is uh, sampling methods, how to actually compute a big distribution like this in practice. So let's, let's call this session sampling methods. And uh, the goal here is really to establish uh, some established numerical numerical representation of P of theta given B of the posterior distribution. That's that's really what the goal here is all about. What exactly the absolute numerical representation means, that is something we'll get back to. But in most cases that people are used to in, in say, a statistical uh, introductory course, that may be something as simple as uh, if you have x here and you want to compute p of x here, uh, and the true distribution looks something like this, and you don't know what that is, but that's, that's the truth. It's one the dimension, and uh, you are able, assume that you are able to compute this, this distribution here for any given value of theta. Uh, you can get a continuous distribution on the computer, but you can compute it for some selected values. In one the, the dimensional, the, the, the one dimension, the easiest thing is just define a grid in X, something like that. Evaluate the function on each of those points. There, there, there. There, 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 and there. So now I have the numbers for each of those positions. I know what the x's are and I know what the values are. I can then interpolate with a linear function or a spline or something like that. Or I can just leave it as a table with x and p of x and say 1, 2, 3, 4, and then 0 0.01, 0 0.04. 0 0.14, 0 0.26, and so on. It's just a, this is a numerical representation. For one dimensional problems, that is difficult to beat. Um, a simple spline uh, version of this would be relevant. One dimension, usually you don't have to think about anything else, just do that. Let's then increase the complexity a little bit. So this is one dimension. Just call it N and What if you are looking at N equals two? In that case, we have P of X comma Y. We have X, we have Y, and we have again this distribution at the end of the last session. Here are the 68 and 95 conference intervals. How to compute this efficiently? Two directions. Difficult to beat gridding again. In this case, you make it grid like this. You evaluate the function at each of these points here. If you want, you can put a, a bilinear spline or a bicubic spline or uh, something like that in the interpolation to get a smooth, smooth and nice function. Difficult to beat that again. Two dimensions, just do that. Don't think more. But the problem uh, we are facing now is, is starting to be, uh, become apparent. And that is, if you look at this range here, there's very little dead space, so to speak, in this. All the, the, the function values that you have are relevant. You can inc include a few more points out here to get a, a bigger grid. But that would just be a relatively small fraction of the whole volume before you figure out that I have to stop this. Here in two dimensions, this is where the important volume lies. And there are many points out here that essentially have zero value. Uh, if you now are thinking that you're increasing this to three dimensions, 
Then uh, the probability distribution is going to be like a ball in, in three dimensional space or a banana or something like that. And all of this edge region here is going to be spanning a bigger and bigger fraction of your entire volume. And uh, if I needed, say, 10 points, uh, so samples and sample points here, so that I needed 10 samples here, in order to capture this one, I would need 10 in that direction and 10 in that direction, so the number of sample points equals 10 squared, that's 100. In three dimensions, so n dimension equals 2. In three dimensions, the number of sample points I need to, to cover the whole space would then be 10 in each dimension. 3 is 1,000. That's probably doable as well. Uh, or perhaps even if you want 100, well, then it's a million evaluations here. Uh, the problem then becomes uh, apparent if you want six dimensional spaces. Uh, say that you want in, in n equals 6. Then the number of sample points that you would have to do the grading is 10 to 6. And that is a lot. So that's a million. And if you want 100 points in each direction because you think this is too coarse, well, then this would be 10 to 12 different samples. And this is what's called the curse of exponentiality. Um, the, the number of samples that you need in order to cover a bigger and bigger uh, space grows exponentially with a number of uh, dimensions. And so in practice, gridding techniques are only used with what n equals one, two, three, perhaps four, and then quickly it, 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 it all falls apart. And this is why we introduce a new class of algorithms and new numerical representation that is not actually a, a regular grid as such, but rather what is called sampling, or uh, in general, what is called Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo name. Uh, place on uh, gambling essentially. There's a random aspect to this. There's, there's a, uh, we're going to be using a random factor, random number generator to, to, to help us. In this case, we're not looking at a, at a regular grid like this. In order to represent this, instead, if you have two dimensions here, x and y, the true distribution lies here. What we're going to do now is try not to grid it, but to draw samples from this. So, uh, and, and the density of samples should be such that uh, the density equals the, the, the true uh, distribution and the, the underlying distribution. So, in this case, the, perhaps I can draw a sample that I look here, another one here, another one here, another one here, another one here, 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 here. Every now and then there might be one out there, but most of the points here is going to be close to the peak. And that's really where the computational expense goes so it comes into play. Uh, the methods that we will be using to draw these samples will be such that they spend their time where the likelihood or, or possible distribution is high. It's going to spend very little time in the outskirts here where, where it's low. And this is why sampling methods are more efficient when you get the high end dimensions. We don't waste computational efforts in the outskirts where there is anyway no significant uh, probability density. So then the question is, uh, you ask, how do we do this in practice? How can we actually ensure that the samples are drawn from this right distribution? And this is where uh, the first method that we'll be talking about, that is really a workhorse of uh, multi column methods, is what is what is called metropolis sampling. Metropolis sampling. That is. Um, it's, it's most easily explained in terms of what the algorithm actually does. So let's let's go back to this case here. Here is a true distribution. We don't know what that is, but we do. We are able to evaluate it at, at a given point. So if you give me a theta, I can compute p of theta given b. That's the assumption. We can compute it for single points. We'll probably do that a million times. We cannot do it 10 to 100 times. But you have some power to compute it many times, but not infinite amount of times. The first step in the algorithm, which I call point zero, is just choose, choose 
an initial initial point point theta zero. And that can, in principle, be anything. So you can just pick a random point. I'm going to stand here. I'm going to close my eyes. There. Okay. This is my theta zero. Then uh, one define uh, what is called a transition transition rule transition rule that takes you to theta i plus one given theta i. So this is another problem of this distribution. It, it, it should vary that's following. If I stand at theta i, if I have a position right now at theta i, I'm going to be able to draw new samples at some probability distribution depending on that, that is theta i plus one. And usually this could, for instance, be a Gaussian centered on theta i and with some standard variation. So what does that mean in practice? The way to think about it in this case is that this, the next sample is going to be close to this one, but with some uncertainty like this. So suppose now I draw a random number with this uh, Gaussian distribution centered on this. So here is a Gaussian like this. And perhaps I end up here. So here is theta zero. This is theta one. So now I have two samples. Two. Uh, yeah, so, so draw theta i plus one from three, except theta i plus one with probability t a equals the minimum of one. That's just because probabilities cannot be larger than one. So to have this as a probability distribution, we just have it. And then the important factor, p of theta i plus one divided by p of theta i. That is often what is called the accept rate uh, ratio. And it's simply the problem, the, 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 the ratio between the probability distribution at this point divided by the whole. So what does that mean? If this thing here, if I propose this one, uh, then this is closer to the center than the old one. So this will have a higher probability than the old one, probability density than the old one. And so this number is larger than that. And this ratio here is higher than one. In that case, A equals the minimum of the one and this, so it's one. So I'm accepting this stage. I'm moving my chain from this to that position uh, because of this accept rate. I'm then going to draw a new proposal. Yeah, and then four. Iterate two plus three. So then I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to get two. I'm drawing a new proposal from this. I perhaps end up here. This is again closer to this one point. And so I am going to accept this point here as well. In the next case, I'm perhaps I end up here. So this is now theta, uh, this is theta one, theta two, theta three. In this case, this is less likely than the old stage. Then I go here. If this is now half as likely, what I do is I draw a uniform uh, number between zero and one. And uh, with using a random number generator on my computer, if that number is less than this, I take the step. If it's not, I, I, keep, I, I keep the old one. And, and so in this case, suppose that this was half, this ratio here was half. I draw a number, I end up at 0.8, which is not less than half. And then uh, I, I stay here. I reject that sample there. I don't move there. So this is now being counted twice in the market chain. Uh, then I propose another one and move up here, perhaps. That's accepted. I maybe go there. I propose this one, but that's killed. Moving up here, here, proposing this, that's killed. I'm moving there, 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 there. 
There, 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 and so on. And now, if you look at the algorithm itself, what this ratio here does ensures is that you're always forced towards the maximum uh, region uh, of density. You're allowed to move out in the edges because this is not deterministic. You don't always move to the peak, just as the ratio this ratio here gives. And precisely because of this ratio, the, uh, you prove mathematically that the density at a given point here is going to be identical to the underlying distribution. So the algorithm is then produce a billion samples or a million samples or a thousand samples from this distribution, make a histogram of the resulting samples, and that will converge towards the, the, the true underlying distribution. And so this now is another numerical representation of data. It's not a grid like this, it's rather a set of samples. Uh, so, so the list of samples, that is theta 0, theta 1, theta 2, theta 3, and so on, this, what is called a marker chain, that is the representation itself. And from that, those samples, we can compute any interesting quantity like the mean or standard deviation or a histogram or, yeah, you can use it for other purposes as well. So that is a, a useful representation of the whole data set. So this is what is called the metropolis sampling. And it's, it's one of the very classic methods that everybody working in the field should be very uh, familiar with. Uh, I, I highly recommend you to write your own metropolis sampler if you haven't done it already for a simple distribution just to see how it works in practice. So that's that's metropolis sampling. The next distribution or, or sampling method that we'll be talking about is a, a generalization of that. That is called metropolis cases. Um, so the properly sampling that was essentially developed in, in, in connection with uh, the Manhattan Project in, uh, during the Second World War, and the, the publication of this uh, method was came out in 1946 or 48 or something like that. Hastings was uh, a generalization that came in 1970. Uh, when this, these methods came up with more computing power, there were people who were more interested, and. The only difference between this and this approach here is that this allows for asymmetric probability distribution metric transition rules. Transition rules. So we haven't even talked about that. But the, there was an assumption here, actually, that I didn't mention, and that is this distribution here has to be what is called symmetric, such that if, if you're standing at a given point, it's equally likely to move to a neighboring point there, as if you were standing here and then move in that direction there. So that is what is called symmetric. This one allows for non-symmetric cases. So in case, suppose, for instance, that you have uh, a true underlying distribution that looks like this, so it's, it's had a heavy, heavy tail in one direction. In that case, it may be advantageous if you're standing here as theta i, I may want to be able to move faster in one direction than the other, um, just to be able to explore it for efficient um, exploration purposes. So instead of having a Gaussian uh, proposal like this, perhaps I want to have something that looks like this instead. That is not allowed by this rule, but Metropolis Hastings does that, fixes that, by changing the accept rule, the new accept rule. That looks like, well, min one, that's there still, e of theta i plus one, e of theta i, and then the ratio of the transition rules in the opposite order. So now it's t of uh, theta i given theta i plus one divided by t of theta i plus one given theta i. And this is now you can see that if this is a symmetric transition rule, well, then this order here doesn't depend on uh, the order. And so this cancels. And, and so 
for uh, symmetric transition rules, this actually defaults back to the ordinary metropolis accelerator. There. Yeah. So, so that, that's that's pretty much all the research. The problem says things then allow for asymmetric transition rules here. Why do we care about that for now? Well, it's, it's quite rare that we actually use that in practice in, in its current form. But there is another special case of this that we do, are using a lot, and you will hear about over and over again as we go along in the two weeks. And that is Gibbs sampling. And in this case, uh, what we're going to do is again consider a multivariate distribution, x, y, and it perhaps looks something like this. And this is now p of x, y. And we want to sample from this. And now, Gibbs sampling is really just a special case of trans no, the transition rule here. What we, we choose to do this as follows. And in this case, you have to have a two or more dimensional distribution. So let's think about it this way xi plus one, comma, yi plus one, given xi, yi. Okay, so we're proposing a move in this two dimensional space from some old stage here to something new. And this something new is what, is what defines the how to choose that something new is what defines the Gibbs rule. And the first thing we're going to do is say, okay, let's keep one of the two parameters fixed. So say here is xi. I'm going to fix that. I'm not, I'm not going to change that at all. And so this is now a delta function in xi plus one minus xi. So this is a probability distribution. If those two are not equal, well, then this is going to be zero. If they are equal, then we get the, 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 the rest of the, the, the terms afterwards. So all that the delta function here says is keep x fixed. Don't change that. The second part of the Gibbs sampling uh, proposal is we actually want to sample directly from the true underlying conditional distribution. So P of Y I plus one given X I. What does that mean? It means that, okay, let's draw this line here. This distribution that lies along this line here, that is exactly P of Y given X. So this is what we were talking about in the beginning of the last session. And now, what I want to do now is I'm going to draw a sample from this distribution directly, not a small step, not a small incremental step like we did in Metropolis sampling, but we're actually going to sample from this distribution. And that brings us perhaps up here. That's, that's a likely point to end up. So you're moving directly from here to up there. And then what Gibbs sampling does is then let's switch and keep Y fixed and draw uh, x from p of x given y. So uh, schematically, that means let's draw this line here. We now have a probability distribution that lies here. I'm going to move over here. So I'm moving along the coordinate lines here, there, and there, and there, and so on. Uh, in order to do this, we have to compute, according to the metropolis uh, distance rule, we have to compute this uh, accept rate. So let's do that in the example. A of Gibbs. That is, let's forget about the one and stuff like here. So, so only the P of uh, theta i. So that is in our case xi, what? No, xy plus one, i plus one, divided by P of x i comma y i. So that is the posterior term here, the posterior ratio. But now, according to the trouble statistics, we also need to have the transition rule ratio here. So this is now times, and now we want to go from the new point to the old one. So that with this here. So that is delta. I'm going to switch. So that's x i. Uh, xi minus xi plus one, e of 
uh, y i given x i plus one. So I'm switching i and i plus one and divide by delta x i plus one minus x i p of i y plus one given x i. So now all of that is to plug in this transition rule into the metropolis Hastings except ratio. Okay, let's take another look at this thing here. What we said from the uh, last session is that this is a joint distribution that can be written in terms of a uh, conditional distribution as follows. This thing here, P or X, I, comma, Y, that can be written as P or Y, I, given X, I, P of X, I. So that was the definition of a conditional distribution. Let's do the same thing here. P of y i plus one given x i plus one p of x i plus one. I've done nothing wrong now, just using the identity that is the definition of the conditional distribution. Okay, let's see what we come out with now. These delta functions here, the delta function is symmetric, so it doesn't really matter the order of those. All this thing here says is that x i plus one should be equal to x i. So I'm going to just remove those and set x i equals, well, x i plus one equals to x i. So that means I'm going to remove the x i's there. I'm going to remove the x i's there. I'm going to remove the x i's there. And that's pretty much it. So what are we left with now? X here, X i, the, the prior terms here, those are the same because it's X i ups, ups, upstairs and downstairs. So that cancels that. And look at the magic now. P of y i plus one given X i. That's actually the same as this one. So this cancels that, and this cancels that, and the whole thing equals one. And that's the magic of give sound. Uh, a problem with metropolis sampling, if you are computing that in a million dimensional space, it's often difficult and expensive to actually compute this ratio because you have to actually compute this million dimensional uh, uh, probability of the distribution in order to actually compute the except rates. With Gibbs sampling, you don't have to do that because this proposal rule here ensures that you actually are within the right dimension uh, distribution. So the only requirement is that you actually have to be able to, 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 to draw samples from these things here. And if so, you don't have to compute this. This is by definition or by, by construction equal to one. And you can always move along coordinate lines like this and sample the right distribution with the right density as given by metropolis Hastings. So that's, that's really what is, lies at the heart of the, 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 the machinery that you'll be using for the next two weeks, and Commander and, and, and you know, the, heart, the heart of Cosmo in general. It's this algorithm here, where we uh, try to uh, draw a conditional distribution, sample from a conditional distribution. What does that mean in practice? Well, If we have a difficult, complicated distribution that looks something like P of, let's call it the Hubble constant, but also the instrumental gain or correlated noise or the C and D map or, uh, I don't know, uh, beam, asymmetric beams or whatever, and you want to compute this whole big thing, that is really, really difficult to do uh, based on the joint distribution alone. I wouldn't even know where to begin to try to write down something that couples the Hubble constant with, say, the, the BS with your beams analytically. That, that's hopelessly difficult. But what gives something now tells us is that we actually don't have to do this. What we can do is break it down into much simpler pieces and do this P of H given data uh, G N core FC and B and B and whatever, then draw a G from D given H given N core 
and so on. And P um, and core given B and everything else. And P of S, C, and B given B and everything else. And this is now the big point. Each of these distributions are much, much, much simpler than this. And usually they have uh, analytical uh, forms that, that you can draw from. Like, uh, say, this one, uh, as score, I will show in this talk, this can actually be written as, uh, and, well, and this one, uh, as multivariate Gaussians that have, yes, billions of degrees of freedom, but they are correlated Gaussian with a known correlation structure that you can sample from. This is, this is more like a, an inverse gamma distribution. Um, and, and so you can mix and match. And the point now is that a general, difficult, complicated distribution like this can be broken down and factorized into much, much simpler steps. In much the same way that an arbitrary complicated sentence may be written out in terms of words, each of the words are simple, and then you can put them together in, into a, a meaningful sentence. So that is what, what we're going to do uh, next talking about the uh, Cosmoglobe or the Beyond Planck data model and the resulting Gibbs sampler, which is going to be the workhorse that we're working with as we go along. So, see you soon.